Good morning, friends. Welcome to the Ladies Bible, a Sunday School Bible class. Um, I thank you so much for being so faithful to uh, listen to, to me give my class. Um, I want to make sure that I start off with prayer and then we're going to talk this morning about the 12 disciples that Jesus uh, chose and we'll, we'll start off first. Father, thank you for your kindness, your goodness. Thank you for your faithfulness that you've given us protection. We ask that you'd open our hearts and mind to your word that we would be able to love you, to honor you, and to fulfill your purposes for our lives. And we ask this in your name. Amen. Um, this morning, we're going to start off with the the 12 disciples, and you can find that if you look in Matthew chapter 10. Uh, in Matthew chapter 10, the, the first few verses, he gives you all of the listing of the 12 disciples. They were Simon, who we know was Peter, Andrew, his brother, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Um, there was Philip, um, and then there was Bartholomew, who's also known as Nathaniel. There was Thomas, the twin, Levi, or Matthew, that's another name that we know him, uh, James, the lesser, there was Thaddeus, and there was Simon, uh, the zealot, and then last, there was Judas Iscariot. It's interesting that whenever we have this list of names, uh, also, uh, their commission from the very beginning, you'll find it right over in Matthew chapter 9. And you found it in Matthew chapter 9 in verse 35. And Jesus commissions them uh, that he went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, healing every disease and every affliction. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful. Uh, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. And uh, if you go over just into chapter 10, there's one other part that I want to make sure that you make a note of, and that is in Matthew chapter 10, verse 5. He says, the twelve, um, these 12 Jesus sent out, but instructions to them were, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim to them, saying, the kingdom of the heaven is at hand. Uh, now, that's interesting, uh, and what's not surprising, that's what you would expect Jesus to say, is to go to Israel. Uh, but the surprising part is what Peter ends up saying. So now this was the beginning call of Peter. And for us to get through all of the progression that I want us to go through, we need to see what Peter's last words were. We found his first commission. Let's find out what Peter says at the very end. And you're going to find that in the book of Acts. And you'll find it in Acts 15. Uh, this is actually the last time that Peter is spoke, that he, he's speaking. And he's at the Council of Jerusalem. Uh, now you do know about First and Second Peter, he's recorded there, uh, and he's referred to several times in Galatians and some of the other books. But this is actually uh, him speaking, and uh, it'll, it'll be interesting to hear what he says. And at this point in the Jerusalem council, council at verse one, uh, some men came from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And so if you go down from there, so you kind of have a context. And in verse uh, 5 up there, uh, But some believers who belong, belong to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, It is necessary to circumcise them, meaning the Gentiles, and to order them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bears witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction uh, between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, these are large statements for a Jewish man to be saying. 
uh, to say that Gentiles, first of all, could even be considered as part of them. This is a Jewish family to, to say that they do not need to be circumcised when as Jews, that was one of the first commandments that they had was circumcision on the eighth day for their sons. Uh, then for them to say that they do not have to keep the law of Moses, um, there's a lot that's happened here for, for Peter to be able to make these statements and be an authoritative statement whenever he made these. So to go back, let's see, let's just follow a progression to find out quickly what it was that happened here that made this change. And actually, all of the uh, large events occurred in the last week of Christ's uh, time here on earth. And that was that shift of not only, almost a shift of the cosmos uh, from that last week from uh, the Old Testament, the covenant of the Old Testament that God had made with Abraham, that he made with the children of Israel through Moses, through the laws, through all the Levitical uh, laws that they were required to keep, through the priesthood, um, uh, through the through the king with the King David, all of these things were going to make a major earth earth shift, and we need to just find out about those. So with that first week, you know that the largest part of that began with the triumphal entry of Christ into Jerusalem. And that triumphal entry, you will actually find, um, I believe, in Luke chapter 21. No, um, Yes, it is. It is. I'm sorry. It's Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19 and verse 28. Uh, and with the triumphal entry, and when he said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village in front of you where you are entering. You will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet set. Untie it and bring it to me. And if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord has need of it. Uh, and so they brought it to Jesus and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And on 36, and as he rode along, they spread their cloaks, their cloaks on the ground uh, as he was drawing near already on the way down the Mount of Olives. The whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the wonderful works that they had seen him uh, doing, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stain, uh, the very stones would cry out. Um, and um, so often, you know, whenever there's a triumphal entry, I mentioned that there was Allenby. I mentioned uh, that there was the, the German Wilhelm who had come through. And so whenever uh, the triumphal entries of uh, the conqueror with Titus and uh, Vespasian, uh, these were men of war like Julius Caesar. Uh, and when they came in with a triumphal entry, there was a great party, but there was always a great victory that had been won. Uh, it wasn't just good deeds. There were great gifts that were given. There was great celebration. There was great wealth that was dispersed. Uh, it was a, a time of celebration for great heroics. But at this point, Jesus had done many miracles, but he was not a great conqueror. Uh, and his battle had not occurred yet. He was getting prepared for the largest battle of all. Uh, he took this as humbly presenting himself as the Messiah to Israel. But his battle, we know, was going to be in just a week. And just five days later, he was going to fight all of hell and all of Satan, and he was going to regain all that had been lost by Adam. And the abdication of, we went over the throne, the, the um, legal heir of the earth, and he was going to fight all of that and battle hell itself and death itself. And so he was going to be a great warrior. But at this point, he was not a great warrior. But we're going to find out what he did do. At this point, he goes over in verse 41 to continue in Luke 19. 
And he said, uh, when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Um, so at this point, he has done like an inspection. As a great general, he has come in and presented himself with all of the works that he's done, uh, of the miraculous works to to um, verify that he truly was the Son of God. He was the Messiah, as they had promised, but he had been rejected by uh, the, the uh, chief leaders and by the high priest, by the priest. And why is that important? Wouldn't that have been... Uh, what was the, the thing that made those high priests so important? And how did their rejecting him make him say that Israel had lost all of uh, that, that opportunity? Uh, and that's important to know uh, because uh, Jesus had, uh, with the Old Testament, he had told them that, that Israel was to be a light to all the world, that they were, they were special to him and he would use them to work. Uh, as showing the ne the um, other nations around the reality of who God was, and uh, he he would do that with his temple. Now, why, if he is Messiah, and we know he is both high priest like Me uh, Melchizedek, and he's also uh, the legal heir. He is the royal lineage of David, um, so he is both uh, the the high priest the and. He's also the king. So whenever you are both, and he's the only person who's been able to do that. So if you have those positions of both high priest and king, well, where do you live? Do you live in a castle? Or uh, what, what do you do? How do you handle being the high priest and the king? And the answer is you go to the, you go to the temple. Uh, the temple was uh, where all of this was. And God had given with his uh, first uh, covenant with Moses, with all the Levitical law, and with the building of the tabernacle, all of that, that information was for the priesthood. And so God had given the priesthood that and made that covenant with them that they were to uh, uh, lead and guide and uh, direct all of Israel, and that their loyalty to him would be one of the most important Things that was their obligation, uh, that was their position that they were given with a, a great, um, not only responsibility, but it had great consequences for if, if they did not carry that out well, if they didn't. So at this point, uh, Jesus has said to them that uh, he has inspected the temple because we know from this point in uh, the early parts of Luke, he would often teach in the temple. He would often go to the temple and watch. He even watched whenever um, a widow, a poor lady, had only given a few cent, and he had just sat there and said nothing, and he said to those around him, she's given more than all the wealthy men who came through because their resources were great, but she actually gave all that she had. So he was observing, and he had that position to be able to do that. Uh, so he was observing what was happening with the temple, and uh, he uh, did something uh, very interesting. Uh, in Luke chapter 21, uh, let me see how, we find that he also has had, um, and, and that's where we find the, uh, the, the widow that was, the, the, was there, that uh, Jesus, at that point after he had presented himself as the high, um, as the and the triumphal entry, uh, that he uh, cleansed the temple, and whenever he cleansed it, it said he uh, he said, "You have made my father's house a den of thieves." And he overthrew the tables, uh, he released the birds, uh, and uh, and he cleansed the temple. Uh, so that was 
his um, verdict on what they had done with the uh, responsibilities that they had been given from God. And he said, instead of making my father's house a house of prayer, you've made it a den of thieves. And so it was his uh, his position to be able to observe what the men whom he had given this responsibility had done with it. And he actually does do that uh, in a um, another one of his verdicts and it's the verdict of the tenants and the tenants you can find in uh, Luke chapter 13 and so I'll just turn back there because I think this is something that we need to just remember Luke chapter 13 and let's see Luke chapter 13 verse 34 all right Um, oh, well, uh, this is a good one. It's not the one I was looking for, but he says, uh, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to it. How often would I have gathered you together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you would not. Your house is forsaken, and I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, I'll come across that other passage in just a moment. But with the tenants, you remember that the Lord had given a demonstration of uh, a, a vineyard owner who had uh, leased out his vineyard to some tenants. He, he sent uh, um, his staff to collect his payments from the vineyard uh, the keepers. And the first ones, they, they stoned them, uh, they injured them, they even killed some of them. And finally, uh, the vineyard owner has said, I will send my very own son and they will respect my son. But instead, they killed his son. And so he was comparing them to uh, this in, in this position that God the Father would be the vineyard owner and that they were to have taken care of the vineyard and given back uh, the the parts that should have been returned to the owner, but instead they had abused and uh, injured his representatives, and then they had at the very end killed his very own son. And this is important. That was not just a parable. He had said the vineyard was going to be taken from them, and those men responsible for having cared for the vineyard would themselves be destroyed because they had neglected their responsibility, and God held them responsible for the Levitical priesthood as much as he did uh, in that example of the people who were taking care of the vineyard that had been leased out to them. So when God says to them, uh, your house is forsaken, Jesus made a verdict. He told them, I've come into the temple I've seen that you've made it a den of thieves. You are no better than the men that I gave you the story about. And God is holding you responsible because you shrugged off your duty and you injured the people by making a den of thieves. Instead of a house of prayer, you've made it a den of thieves. And so uh, he cleanses the temple. And by doing that, he has showed that he has reclaimed that position for himself. He has rejected uh, the temple priest, and he's rejected them because of their uh, uh, abuse of the responsibilities that they were given by God to take care of the temple. That was their responsibility. So he has uh, reclaimed it himself. He has said that um, they would not be able to continue. It's taken back from them. He has taken back the covenant that he made with them uh, because they misused the responsibilities that were given to them, and he's cleansed the temple. Uh, so he's made his verdict that it is uh, desolate, that he has uh, removed them uh, from that position. And next he says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give it to someone else. I'm going to give it to someone else. And in Matthew chapter 26, let me see if I've got that one written down correctly. Matthew 26. Um, well, let's see. 
and I think I have it over here as 28. Uh, what he has done here is that he's instituting a new covenant. Now we know this part. We know that the, the uh, breaking of bread, that the Lord's Supper is the new covenant. But I want to make sure that you understand that what he was going to do was complete all of the old of the old covenant. And these 12 men were going to record there was not one, he even says, not one iota, not one dot of the law that he did not completely fulfill himself. Uh, as the last lamb of that covenant, he would be the last lamb. It would be the last Sabbath, and all of that would be done whenever he was uh, on uh, on Calvary at his crucifixion. But he also was making a new covenant with a new group of people and giving them the responsibilities that he had given Israel. He did not uh, replace Israel with this new one, but there would be a new um, institution, a new way of dealing with people, and that would be this new covenant. So in Matthew chapter 26, um, and he's in verse uh, 26, he says, Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body. Ta and then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks to it, he said, Drink you all of it, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. In, that, in ancient periods of time, a covenant was always with a blood, a cut sacrifice. And you remember that's what happened with uh, Abraham, a cut sacrifice. Uh, and it was blood that was shed. Jesus is saying with this covenant that I am making as God, with this covenant, my body will be the cut sacrifice. And so whenever he says, this is my body that is broken, uh, whenever he was hanging on the cross with the shedding of blood, with the spear in his side, with the beatings, with the wounds that he said, that is the cutting of this sacrifice. And I will do it with my own body. And he says, and with this blood, this blood is uh, the blood that's being shed for the covenant. It is not a, a lamb. It is not an animal. I will do this my very set, my own self and shed that blood for you for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the wine uh, until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And so we find that he has, uh, at this point, Solomon made a, a solemn a, a promise that he would himself be the sacrifice that's needed for the forgiveness of sins. And by doing that, he is completing the last part of uh, the Old Testament once more. That would complete the house of Israel. Um, and whenever he says they missed their appointment, they did not recognize uh, that he had come. He was the Messiah. He could have done all the things that they were expecting that John the Baptist had said. Uh, they, you know, John the Baptist had them, and they were always thinking they would come in, the Messiah would just destroy Rome and restore uh, all the, the beauty and, and, and splendor and power uh, that Solomon had. And, uh, and that was not what he was telling him. It won't work like that. Uh, whenever he had the disciples, he was saying, even uh, whenever he was at this part, whenever the disciples were arguing about who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom. And he said, in my kingdom, uh, the least, if you have to be the best servant. Uh, my kingdom's not going to be like the kings that you're accustomed to. And so he was doing everything different. So it was not only, it was just a whole attitude, uh, but it was the completion, the completion of the, the last covenant, the old covenant with Israel. It was going to be the beginning of a new covenant. And with the beginning of this new covenant, it was going to be ratified on the cross with his death. Whenever Jesus was hung there, and uh, and they are careful to make sure that every part that would have been required for the sacrifice of the lamb by the Levitical priest in the temple was done for Jesus. Uh, the time he was hung, it was at 9 a.m. The time he died was at 3 p.m. Uh, the lamb was... was um, 
examined by the high priest. The high priest is the one who um, had made sure that he declared that this man should die. And uh, he even said, tell me, the high priest had said to him, tell me if you are the son of God. And Jesus quoted to him what I had said earlier uh, in, in Daniel chapter uh, 10, uh, Daniel 9, that you will see the Son of God, you will see the Son of Man coming with His glory. Uh, you will see His power. And uh, the priest recognized that that was the Messiah, and he said, that's blasphemy, and he deserves to be crucified. He deserves to die for that. Um, and so uh, Jesus, with His death on the cross, completed every requirement that was needed for uh, the the old covenant. Whenever he said finished, not only had he completed the payment for all the sins of mankind, but he had completed all of the Levitical requirements that he'd connected himself with the land of Israel. And whenever he died, uh, it's uh, he was died on that Saturday. That was the last Sabbath of the Old Testament was that that day, that Saturday, when Jesus was in the grave. Uh, and it was quiet, and it, and it seemed that there was no hope. But we know that the following day, Sunday, that Sunday, was the vindication of the Lord Jesus by his resurrection. And from then, everything changed. Uh, it was never going to be like it was before. And to prove his point, there were some things that happened that were ir irreversible. One of those is that, the, indeed, the temple was destroyed, just as he said in 70 AD. It was doomed. It, it served no other value. It was served no other purpose. And in 70 AD, he destroyed um, Jerusalem. He destroyed that temple. Not one stone left upon the other because it served no value anymore. And whenever the... Uh, disciples had been walking through it and they said look at how beautiful this building is he showed no emotion he said it's doomed it's doomed it's all finished but what he did care about was the people of jerusalem those are the ones that he wept over and said you've missed your time of appointment uh, and so it was the people that he cared and loved for not the buildings uh, and in this new covenant he is uh, saying that he is extending this to uh, a whole different kind of uh, uh, a group of people. And now, if we had said that with Peter uh, in uh, uh, Acts chapter 15 and verse 5 at the Council of Jerusalem, he had mentioned that he it was inclusive of the Gentiles. And we actually find that the Gentiles are, the, the first Pentecost was uh, 50 days after uh, all of this, and we find that in, in Acts uh, chapter 2, we know that in Acts chapter 2, that they were in the upper room and that the Spirit came down and they were, they were all Jews and they were baptized with the Holy Spirit and filled with that power which God, to which Jesus himself had said he was going to send at his ascension. Uh, he said, I will uh, give you the power of the Holy Spirit to do what I need for you to do. Uh, and so uh, in Acts chapter 2, all the Jews that were in the upper room were baptized. But, you know, we'll just say that word Pentecost because it means whenever the Holy Spirit came, there was actually, a, there were four Pentecosts where there were believers that were filled by the Holy Spirit. One of those was in Genesis chapter 2. The verse was, I'm sorry, in Gen Acts chapter 2, uh, in Acts chapter 8, uh, and uh, then there was Acts chapter um, 10, and that was with Cornelius, and Acts chapter 19. Uh, so if you want to, we'll just look real quickly at some of those to, to uh, go over those. Let's see if I can get my notes all together here. Um, we'll, you know, those, let's just do, let's do the last one, because in Acts chapter 2, it was all Jews. In Acts chapter 8, uh, it was Jews and Samaritans. In Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius, it was a Gentile, but it was a very devoted Gentile. So you would think, okay, but in Acts chapter 19, it was just an ordinary, everyday, run-of-the-mill Gentile. And uh, and that one, uh, if you want to just look at that, that's in Acts chapter 19, and it starts in verse 1. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, 
Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. And there he found some disciples. And he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No, we've not even heard if there is the Holy Spirit. And he said, And to what were you baptized? And they said, Into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him. That is Jesus. And on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and began speaking in tongues and prophesying. And there were about 12 men in all. And so this is that big change whenever they could see that God in his wisdom had changed the the buildings, he'd given them now a new temple. And it was the bodies of these believers. The Holy Spirit was going to fill the bodies. So he'd given them uh, a, a new um, um, leadership. He'd given them a, a new temple. And that was it. And also he had said uh, that he was uh, going to, he was indeed going to come back. But he said, I want you to go and uh, tell the whole world about this. And uh, the part that's important to remember is that at, this, at, at the earlier point, the Jews were no longer to say that the Gentiles or anybody else in this new body of Christ, which were Jews and Gentiles, and they were equal of value to God, each of them filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, that they, they were... Um, all uh, they were all equal in the in the sight of God and in his value of them. Uh, so I hope that this has been helpful for you. Um, and he, whenever he tells them to go and to witness to the whole world, uh, the Gentiles are the one that have ended up doing that. Uh, primarily, uh, the greater the as time went by, not very not very long time. Uh, even Paul had to go back and say, salvation is by faith. And we found that he emphasized that in Galatians, uh, in Ephesians, uh, in Hebrews, and even Peter in the book of Acts that we read had to re go back to saying, we are saved by faith and God's grace is the one that's done this. He's given us a remission of sins and uh, it's no longer, it's never been keeping a law. Because if that could have been true, the Pharisees would have been the first ones that were that were uh, considered righteous, and they were not. And so he gave us this emphasis that it's faith uh, that is what keeps us, what gives us, uh, that accepts, has us accepted into this relationship with God. Our faith in what a finished work of Jesus, what he's done for us. He cleansed us. He paid for all of our sins. He's given us the Holy Spirit, and he's given us the promise that he is going to come again. That was just one, one first, first coming, but his second coming will fulfill all of the hopes and dreams that everybody had thought that his first appearance as Messiah would bring. He will come in power and might that he's been given, and he will set up a righteous kingdom upon this earth, and he allows us to be part of that with him. So I hope you've enjoyed this. Read these verses over uh, and we can just rejoice in what the Lord Jesus has done for us. Thank you folks so much. Have a great day. Love you.